Hello, Scott. How are you? Hey, Shane, how are you out there in the West? Oh, you know, just, just doing the same thing that everybody else is trying to do. Stay at home and stay entertained. How about you? I know New York is a hot spot right now. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I had to, I have um, two shut-ins I try to help a little bit. So this weekend, I, I, in addition to getting some stuff for our, our cooking session, I went and delivered some food. And I'm struck here by generally the streets are empty. Mm. There's a class differential where people who are kind of lower end of the spectrum are not always abiding by all the ways they should or could. Um, but the streets are generally empty and over, um, I don't know, 80% are people doing the, the social distancing if you're out and the stores are all um, limiting the amount of people. So that's good. And, you know, now, at least in New York, they're asking us not to go out at all this week. Mm, sure. So they don't even go to the grocery store. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's pretty restrictive. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you got all your groceries, Scott. <laughs> I'm pretty good. We might be vegan by Saturday. Let's just say that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being vegan. Nothing wrong with being yeah, vegan. No, no, no. I mean, that's okay. I like it, but like the animal protein, the fish will probably be gone. You know, there might be a little bit in the freezer, but it's a lot of vegetables here, a lot of beans, a lot of grains. <laughs> well, so what are we cooking today? So I thought I would pull something out of not my culinary heritage, but the heritage of the work I do in Northeastern Brazil, which is kind of the most ubiquitous dish in Salvador da Bahia. It's called moqueca. And it's an interesting stew that is, um, has two basic variations. It's usually a fish stew. Um, and if you make it the traditional way, it gets finished much like bouillabaisse, base where there's an emulsification of olive oil and palm oil at the end, fast boil kind of thing. But if, if you don't use palm oil, it has another name called ensopado or to be, you know, to be soup like, I guess you'd say. Mm. In English. So, if you so say that have, again. I, I want to learn the word. Ensopado. Ensopado. Yep, and that's Port Portuguese? Portuguese, yeah. And so that would be just the same recipe, but you wouldn't have palm oil at the end. And the palm oil is very fragrant. I have a brand that I like that I get from Brazil. And every time Brazilians come to visit me, I have them bring it. Because if you see palm oil in the stores in New York, it's easiest to find either in African, West African stores or in Chinatown. Sure. It's usually, it's one of these oils that is uh, often at room temperature, it's solid. But this one that's called the, uh, uh, flor, flor especial, flor gidende, the flower of, of, of palm oil, is a nice taste. It's got a nice aroma. I guess I would liken it to a very good extra virgin. Okay, so to get started, is this is actually not a hard dish, and it's a dish that is geared to improvisation. Mm. So classically, you're basically going to sweat some vegetables, onion, sweet red pepper, like a cubanelle or a green pepper, um, a little bit of chili pepper to your heart's desire. It will get, I'm going to make mine with shrimp and I had some Atlantic cod. I'm going to mix, um, but it could be many kinds of fish based on what you have available. It gets fish. And, and what I have available is actually Pacific Northwest salmon. So uh, yeah, I'm going to adapt. <laughs> so the thing I would say, and that's, this is an adaptive dish. I, I'll say this. One of the things that Brazilians say, the moqueca they want that you want your mom to make is with shrimp. So if you have shrimp, make moqueca with shrimp. If you don't have shrimp, make it with fish. If you don't have shrimp, make it with eggs, like a soft boiled egg. Right? If you don't have that, make it with jackfruit. If you don't have that, make it with beef lung. <laughs> because that's, that's like, I mean, yeah. is that more accessible, I guess? I guess it's not well, as- uh, they're in the interior, there's a lot of cattle ranching, so I guess it would be, and, and for most cultures, lung is one of the least favored parts of a, a four-legged four animal. So it probably is in the open-air markets, it would be available and cheap, right? You had no money. And so the thing that I would say, the one thing I would say to you is, you're gonna do it to your taste. You might add a little more lime juice because salmon is fatty and richer, ri fattier mm -hmm. and richer than mm -hmm. shrimp is or my cod. So that, and I think that's the, the, the kind of raison d'etre. 
you use it to your taste and you ad adapt slightly based on the fish you chose and how much acidity you like against coconut milk. Got it. And the other thing I did to adapt was uh, this, because the salmon is not as hearty as uh, some of the other white fishes that you had suggested. Mm -hmm. I shortened the amount of marination time in the citrus. Okay. Um, yeah, because wouldn't that overcook the fish? Yeah, at a certain point, Over you're going to Yeah, it's going to start to ceviche it, and we don't want to do that. Okay. Let's get started. All um, right, let's get started. So, uh, just like a yellow onion. Yeah, yellow, regular Spanish onion. And you said you sliced yours? I'm going to try to mimic you. So, I'm going to show you, I sliced mine like this, you know, from the North Pole to the South Pole, so to speak, just thin slice. Oh, okay. And how thick were your slices? They're about, about a quarter of an inch, maybe. I sort of stay with one program. If you slice the onion, then I slice uh, a red bell pepper, the cubanelle. You know, I tend to slice everything once I, if I start to slice, if I dice, I dice everything. Mm -hmm. That's a similar concept in Chinese cooking. You want everything to be similar shape, so they all cook in the same way. Because yeah, for me, it's, a, it's twofold. It's exactly that. Similar shape for cooking. And then what do I want in my mouth feel? You know, if I, if I have it all chopped, then there's a likelihood that in every mouthful, I'll have a little bit of pepper, a little bit of onion, a little bit of tomato, et cetera. Mm, sure. Now right, so I have my uh, yellow onion cut. What should I do next? Okay, so if you have a red pepper, you can cut it the same way. Okay, I have uh, these little mini bell peppers. Oh, those are great. So I'll, I'll cut a few of them. Yeah. Just so it's interesting because I, I guess everybody is doing with what they can. And like yep. I, I went out, they didn't have cilantro, which is what I usually finish this with. So mine won't have cilantro at the finish. Mm. And they, but they did have um, shishito peppers and one cubanelle. Ooh, so like nice. I am combining now, my partner doesn't like food really spicy. This mm -hmm. is usually slightly piquant, but as we have a tradition in Northeastern Brazil, usually you have, and I just got some from Sao Paulo from a friend, a very spicy hot sauce that I'll have on the side. Oh, and nice. That usually in most restaurants or homes, there are some kind of homemade or store-bought hot sauces, all of the open markets, well, sometimes it's just as simple as different peppers and vinegar, and you just shake out the vinegar. Some make a pounded hot sauce with peppers and spices, but they're always on the table if you want to ramp it up. And just uh, chopped on the tomatoes. That, the tomatoes I will chop, because I want them to break down a little bit more. Yes. And the thing I didn't tell you, because I didn't think you could get it, that I use, and again, when Brazilians come, because I have a lot of connections to Brazilians, the two things I ask for are, can you bring me palm oil this type, and can you bring me smoked and dried shrimp? Because in Asian markets, I can get dried shrimp, but this is smoked and dried, and it's got the same kind of umami like anchovies or fish sauce, and realistically, it doesn't, it's not, uh, that traditional in the recipe, but it mm -hmm. gives that little push forward in flavor. All right, I have my tomatoes cut, the onions, the peppers. Uh, I have the green onions. So you can slice okay. the green onion from white to green, the whole thing. Okay, I will do and that. If you like a hot pepper, you can put a hot pepper. I use two serranos, but I didn't use the seeds. All I have is jalapeno. That's fine, I mean. Okay. All right. Well, I just did half a seeded jalapeno. But I've measured out a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. So I'm going to start. Have a, I'm getting my pan hot. Uh, what temperature? Medium, a medium flame. I don't want to brown the vegetables. I want to wilt them or sweat them, whatever verb you prefer. I'm going to start, you know, I have my onions. If you combine them all, that's okay. So I am sweating all the onions here. Do I, can I put the peppers in as well? Or yeah, is it yeah, go ahead. 
No. I'm going to that... put all the peppers in. And how long are we cooking the onions so, here? You know, the kind of classic, I want the onions to start to look translucent, but I don't want to make it what, uh, like a soup piece. I don't want to make the kind of soft like you do for onion soup. I want them to have okay. a little bit of a, a texture, but they start to look translucent. So I have my onions in. I just put in my hot peppers. I, oh, I, I, I like to do, but a lot of times when I saute onions, I'll put a pinch of salt in to bring the water out to start. Do you do that? I do. So I will do a pinch of salt to do the same. So now that my onions are getting hot, I'm going to add first my cubanelle peppers. I've got my, I use serranos, you use jalapeno. Yes. Um, I now have my cubanelle and the onions inside. So now I'm getting, this is all starting to come down. I'm adding my red pepper. And so, you know, two things I want to share. One other thing I want to share with you is this is the kind of thing you can have anywhere in northeastern Brazil. But in most parts of Brazil, even in the south, they'll make this because it is such a ubiquitous dish. And when you have it in a restaurant, they usually have it made in a clay pot that gives a certain flavor to it. And it comes to the table boiling furiously. And it's ideally cooked over an open flame. And I've had some places where they'll cook it over a wood fire, right? Wow. So that um, lends, that would lend some of that wood smoke aromas yeah. to it as well, right? My first home version, a friend of mine who's an, a sculptor, but he, as happens in my family too, his mother only had boys. So one of the boys was taught to cook the way women had traditionally been taught to cook. So um, his name is Fori, Carlos Fori, and he is an excellent cook because he had to help his mom when she worked to cook. Um, and he wanted me to understand, because he understood I was researching when I was first coming to Brazil, and he wanted me to understand, this is an important dish, you need to know how to make it, you need to know how to make it. I want you to take pictures, I want you to take film, I want you to take notes, you need to know how to do this, because this is part of us. And so we spent an afternoon and showing me how to cut, you know, I knew how to cut, but in what he wanted me to see. But the one that was as good and maybe even more memorable, I do a lot of work with um, the intersection of sacred and secular cuisine in Afro-Brazilian communities. And a friend of mine who's a priest in an uh, African temple, his mom is a priestess as well. And she liked me and wanted to make lunch for me and invited me over for Mokeka in this fishing village on an island. And I knock on the door, she opens the door and throws a coconut at my feet. And I'm sort of astounded and I say, hi, Dona Maria. And she says, well, I'm just, I needed the hard surface by my door because I need to make fresh coconut milk if we're gonna do this. And <laughs> so, then, I wish uh, I known I would have uh, a thrown, thrown a virtual coconut at you. So. Um, <laughs> I love your stories, um, but I need to pause. And so you're ask soft, you. probably. Yes. So my onions okay. are done, and I. I uh, and you have all the veggies in. All the veggies are in. Okay. Can I have so the tomatoes I'm just now. Doing my tomatoes now. I'm just going to get the tomatoes to warm through, and I'm going to take out once I have my tomatoes integrated. Maybe two minutes. Okay. I'm going to take half of the vegetables out. Okay. I've got a little container to that effect. But I'm basically making a bed and think of what I'm taking out as the blanket. So I have a nice surface inside. And now my marinated um, shrimp, I'm gonna lay in. I haven't turned the uh, fire down. I'm gonna cover the shrimp. I mean, cover the vegetables with the shrimp in my case. And then as I said, I have some Atlantic cod. I'm also going to use, I'm going to put that on the sh top of the shrimp because I think it's going to cook a little bit uh, more quickly than the shrimp. So hopefully the shrimp is my buffer. And I'm going to then take, I'll pour this marinade right on top. It's got lime juice and I'm going to cover all of that fish with the vegetables. And I'm going to pour in, oh, I'm going to, Put some of my scallions on top. 
pour in my coconut milk. I have my heat really high. I took a little bit of my smoked and dried shrimp and I ground them in the mortar and pestle. So I'll put a little bit of that on and I'm gonna leave. They wouldn't probably cover it, but for time, I'm gonna cover mine once I see that the coconut milk comes up to a boil. So they would they wouldn't cook it uh, traditionally it wouldn't be cooked without a lid. They would just let it, they would just let it boil so they can watch it. And the, and then how long does it simmer? So for me, I think with these shrimp, probably about five minutes, I should be done. And the cilantro goes in at the end. At the very end. So at the end, once we think this, in your case, the salmon is let's say 85 90 percent cooked mm -hmm. you'll pour in the last two tablespoons of olive oil and let that emulsify pour in your um i drizzle with your uh sprinkle with your cilantro and it's ready to go well it's looking pretty that's for sure it's a pretty dish it's aromatic and then i have a little bit of lime juice so i'm going to taste it right before i put the oil in to see if i want it to be to have a stronger bite based on how rich it is. and Now tell me, you're, um, catch me up a little bit. You're, you've been teaching, you teach at NYU. Yeah, and I've been teaching now online with Zoom. So. That's great, how's that been going? You know, it's interesting and complex. There's been, it was a good article in the Times Friday about this. Luckily for me, my schools that I teach in are mostly private and the kids have most of their tools. So, uh, you know, but my partner, she's at one of her schools, they've had to give both professors and students uh, computers, because not everybody had a computer to be online. Mm -hmm. um, the beginning, it was a little dicey because the people are upset and anxious. So um, sure. it's, an, it's an evolutionary process and where uh, all my classes are going to pass fail, but the students have until the last day of classes to decide what they want to do. And what are you, what subject are you teaching this or I'm what's teaching, the I'm teaching um, uh, environmental studies that's looking at food and farming through a racialized lens predominantly African American, but also the Asian Americans and indigenous people. Uh, it's his, it initially was historical. So we started in the beginning of the founding of this country, but we're now um, just out of civil rights coming into the modern era. I'm teaching a uh, food, art, and public policy, kind of how to be a change agency, agent, policy advocate, artist making food-based art, or art actually with food, very interesting. And I teach two That's studio classes that are healthy cooking and um, cultural studies of international foods for nutritionists. So now I'm wow. getting a nice bubble me you too. I've got a bubble. Um, should I season this with anything? Does it need yeah, salt? I would, if you haven't added more salt, I would put a little salt. So I forgot okay. to do it. Talking to you, to your taste. I like salt. You decide what you want. But yeah, again, mine's, mine's pretty good. I think my fish is done too, and I don't want to overcook it. So I'm going to so turn off the heat. Done. And if you have a little bit of olive oil, it tastes, yes. taste it for how much, if you like the lime juice, add a little mm -hmm. bit of olive oil. And either stir it or let it bubble up so it emulsifies and it's ready to stir. Sprinkle with cilantro. Okay. And I'm going to check my shrimp because I think, yeah, my shrimp is good. So I'm going to take, on my end, I have hot oil and olive oil. I'm pouring them in. I'm going to add a little bit of lime juice. Mm. Turn it off. And I'm just going to stir it to combine. Now, of course, I'll be real honest. I'm using palm oil like a condiment. Some people there would make it heavier and richer with palm oil and that, and a lot of Americans have issues around palm oil. If you can Tell me see about my, that. Like what's the, it, there's controversy around palm oil. Well, and it's weird because right now also it's become a superfood. So there's both the controversy of deforestation and health for some, but it's also a superfood. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is good. <laughs> It is um, really so good. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh... So I'm going to try to take it. I have a, 
I could serve it here, but I'm trying to see if this, if I serve it, if I take it out of this dish and put it in a serving dish, if it'll show better for uh, this, our Zoom TV. But you see, it's a fairly quick dish. It is. And you can see how you could, um, in the simmering stock, you could drop eggs and have, not egg drop, but have a, like a coddled egg or like a, um, a, a poached egg, so to speak, if you didn't have the shrimp or you didn't have the salmon or didn't have the cod. I'm just going to put this in a little shallow bowl here. And you said typically it's served with rice? Rice on the side, yep. Hot sauce on the side. Um, if you'd rather have bread, fine. If you don't want any of the carbs, that's fine too. Mm. Look at that. What do you think, Scott? Does this does this meet your approval? Oh, that looks great. Here, I'll show you yeah. mine. I don't know if you can see my fish. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. So I want the thing that I was invited to a virtual cocktail party the other day. I want to virtually eat this with you, right? <laughs> we can do that. And here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Taking my first bite. Oh, what do you, what do you say? Is that, what's the equivalent to Bon Appetit in Portuguese? Oh, it's you know? Bon Appetit. All right. First bite. Mm. Oh, that's good. Mm. I haven't had more no. cake in a while. Mm. So mine's not um, technically moqueca because I don't have the palm oil, right? Mm -hmm. So you have ensopado. How's your ensopado? The ensopado is delicious. I love the combination of the lime juice and um, the coconut milk. Like it, it doesn't. The coconut milk is not overpowering. I thought it might be overpowering, but it's not. No, and if you do it, in my mind, if you do it with a sense of balance, it's got a nice delicacy. Mm-hmm. And were your jalapenos in the end, were you spicy? Because I want to use a little bit of my hot sauce. Um, it was, the jalapenos were not spicy. I probably should have used the whole pepper and added the seeds in there. Cause, but, you know, it's hit or miss with jalapenos. Yeah, it is today. You know, I used to work with Mayans for years when I lived in California. And these are working class guys, two room apartments, eight guys in a, in a two room apartment. The, what their indulgence was, was to send home for wild jalapenos to be shipped to them. Wild jalapenos. Okay, so the, the ones here were in the West Coast that were, you know, agro industrial, they said didn't have the flavor. They Cultivated. Wanted. This is too much fun. This is delicious. So how, like, I'm so curious about the work that you do and what you teach, um, you know, trying to, to teach people culture and cultural anthropology through food. That's just such a fascinating thing and, and way too vast to, to break down within the confines of this call. But, you know, what's, what's one thing that, that you might send the people away with just a thought in their mind about the, the connective tissue that food is. Well, you know, I, I think food is always a window into someone's culture. And one of the things we did today in class online, we're reading about a, an anthropologist friend and colleague who is, did a, a, a research on a, a black neighborhood I didn't know of in DC. A black neighborhood called Deanwood in, East, in DC. Her name is Ashanti Reese. And it, the book is called Black Food Geographies. And she's looking both historically in the 20th century, the Great Migration, the advent of the supermarket, and the change in this, this, this neighborhood. And there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurship early on. And so when we were talking about it and reading these interviews she had recorded, as well as interviews she found from the 30s and 40s, I then asked the students, um, what makes you feel good if you go somewhere to eat? Um, what makes you feel uh, respected, because this is one of the things that came up in her interviews, which then they had to think about what does it mean to feel respect in an, a friend's home or a restaurant. And then I asked them, 
what is it, if you have children or nieces or nephews, what are the dishes you need them to know that are reflective of the culture that you grew up in? And almost all of them were my Nona this, this thing I make with my mother at the holiday that then makes them understand differently what they're reading as less theoretical and actuarial, which is always the, I think always taking theory and putting into practice. So we see how it is in our lived experience is key. Scott, that was so beautiful. I'm feeling a little teary eyed now because it, it just, it hits right here. Uh, Cause that's what, that's what it's about, right? Like I, my, my book, that's what, that's what it's about passing on those recipes to um, like the specific audience I had in mind were my children and, and their cousins. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that was my focus, but it turns out there are a lot of people who are looking for these recipes too. So um, that completely resonates with me. And the last thing I want to say that is both quixotic and fascinating. So, you know, in, in Brazil, most of the women I, most people I deal with are women and they're usually 50 to hundred years of age and they're either religious or not, or both, and I'm in their kitchens, or I'm in the temple kitchen. And when I ask them about how they learned to cook, they all, almost anyone who's over 50 says, when I was eight or 10, I was brought into the kitchen, told I'd make a better wife, think about if you're 70, what that would be like 60 years ago, um, if I could cook. If I can't cook, they'll teach me how to sew, they'll teach me all these things, but cooking would be best. And they basically made a snack with the, um, intestinal tract of a chicken so if the it was ruined the family could still eat dinner because they could have the chicken but it was such a gross job that if the girl could do it then the mother or grandmother said oh you have aptitude right mm -hmm. so they made it a game and so i asked well how did that work with your grandchildren I said, well i couldn't go to co um complete high school and i couldn't go to college and my grandchildren can so i want them to be able to excel as women so what i'm doing is I'm, I'm teaching them our taste they don't always know how to cook it but they know when it's made properly this mm. is our food which is interesting that's fascinating and wonderful um i'm so so glad that you're doing this work and and continuing to to teach others to appreciate um, these values it's the way i was raised and i want to pass it Thank you for bringing me into your kitchen today. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I so treat. appreciate it. And I'm so going to be in the West Coast for, you know, half an hour, an hour. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Can we go swimming next time? <laughs> well, let me see. <laughs> I don't know. Or the sailing? out here is not that warm. Yeah, probably sailing or paddle boarding or something. Okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for this invitation. We'll the best see you to next your time. family. Good health. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.